This Restorative Justice Life is a production of Amplify RJ. Follow us on all social media platforms at Amplify RJ. Sign up for our email list and check out our website at AmplifyRJ.com to stay up to date on everything we have going on. Make sure you're subscribed to this feed on whatever platform you're listening on right now so you don't miss an episode. And finally, we'd love it if you left us a rating and review. It really helps us literally amplify this work. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to This Restorative Justice Life, the podcast that explores how the philosophy, practices, and values of restorative justice apply to our everyday lives. I'm your host, David Ryan Barsega Castro Harris, all five names for the ancestors, and I'm the founder of Amplify RJ. On this podcast, I talk with RJ practitioners, circle keepers, and others doing this work about how this way of being has impacted their lives. This is the third episode of this podcast, and I hope it's a weekly thing. We had some audio challenges this week, so if you are someone who does work in podcasting or wants to learn and help us out, hit us up at amplifyrj at gmail.com and we'll work something out. A couple years ago, our guest brought some folks from New York to a Circle Keeper training I was co-facilitating with the late Aura Shub in Chicago. Instead of staying in a hotel with her team, she stayed with her family on the west side of Chicago, pretty close to where I was living at the time. So I gave her a ride home every day of the training. We really bonded during those car rides, and since then, she's been one of my go-to people when it comes to doing this work. I don't know where I learned the term, but friend-tour is one of the best ways I know how to describe our relationship. I deeply treasure our friendship, and I've learned so much from her. So I'm very excited to share her story and her wisdom with you all. Let's get into our conversation with Ashley Shanise Ellis. Welcome, Ashley. Who are you? I am Ashley Shanise Ellis. Who are you? I am the daughter of baby George Ellis Sr. and Lizzie Mae Jenkins, and the granddaughter of Bessie Beatrice and Hattie Madea. Who are you? I am um, the life partner and wife to Kandisha. I am baby sister to Bailey and Pharaoh. I'm a sister and friend and mentor to many. Who are you? I am a warrior. I am love and action. I am a peacekeeper and a conduit of healing for him. Who are you? I am a Black girl, a queer Black girl from the west side of Chicago um, who learned that if you gave her a place to stand, she could conquer the world. Who are you? I am the prayers personified of my ancestors. I am the dream of my mother and my community. I am, I am hope. And finally, who are you? <sighs> I am me. I am the promise that God created me to be in the world. Thank you for introducing yourself. Uh, you took that to a level that nobody else has gone to yet. Like even one of your answers are like, boom, 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 boom. That's it. But I hope we touch on a lot of that in our conversation today. Um, I'm curious how that felt sharing. Um, at this particular point in my life, it felt it felt really good because um, 
in full transparency, I called you a couple of weeks ago and that was what was on my heart. And you were asking me these questions and, um, and it was, and you challenged me in them too, lovingly challenged me in them. Um, and so to stand here and breathe my way through that, um, and to powerfully believe it, um, it made me, it made me feel like, yeah, I am like, I am, I am that I am all those things. Yeah. 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 I mean, the reason that we open the podcast with that is so folks get to introduce themselves beyond um, job titles, mm-hmm. right? Um, because that's so often where we like categorize people. But um, it's also really a powerful exercise to think about for yourself. Um, you know, who who are you? Who do you, you believe yourself to be? Not um, who the world tells you you are. Yeah. Uh, like, who, who really are you? So uh, thank you um, for your transparency, your vulnerability. Um, now, how are you? I was, oh, go ahead. I was going to add to that too, because just, I just thought about it, like knowing who I am in these moments, especially um, like the world tries to create this narrative for who I need to be. Um, and I think people have this idea about who I need to be. And if I don't know that for myself, then I will just be caught up in their imaginations of me um, and be crushed by it because I'm not living in my full self. Um, And also remembering and being reminded about who I am allows me to stand in my power around things that I doubt sometimes that I have the ability to do. Um, And when I remind myself of who I am and whose I am and where I come from, um, then I'm reminded that I'm enough, right? That I, that I am able and that when I walk in the faith of those who come before me and the prayers of those who come before me, um, then like I, I can do whatever it is that I want to do and whatever it is that I need to do. And so that has been the practice of naming myself and knowing who I am has really strengthened me in that way and in a time where I was doubting myself a lot. Um, mm. so, yeah. yeah. What was one of those times? Um, in this work, um, in the work of restorative justice, you know, like um, I was, you know, before COVID shut everything down, you know, I was really doing a lot of, you know, training, consulting, coaching, working with young people, Every day of the week, I'm gathering, um, and I loved it. And when things shifted, I didn't think that in full transparency, I I resisted stepping into the online platform because I I couldn't Mm -hmm. imagine yet how to do it, um, how to bring circles to squares, to Zoom, to (laughs) this thing where I couldn't see physically and be and feel people. Um, and I kept telling myself like, and also spirit was like, no, it's okay to, to rest right now, to not feel the void. And so that was a piece of it. But as I was making my way back to it, I realized that there was a balance in spirit telling me to rest. And also in wanting to come back, I was, I didn't feel like I was enough. I didn't feel like what I had was enough to bring to the online platform. Maybe there was only something special that happened when I was in person with people. Um, And maybe that wouldn't translate online because I lacked something um, or I didn't know how to do something or have conversations on this platform in a way that you do when you're present with people. Um, And so there was this, this voice in the background that was creating these excuses but it was also saying that like you're not enough you know you don't really have what it takes just you know let other people do they they have to move out the way and other people do it you know um and so that was one of those times and I recently had to be reminded and to remember for myself about who I am yeah to show up fully in this work and to give my best to those um who I walk alongside, who I co-journey with, who I um, share these experiences with. Yeah, what does that look like for you right now? 
Um, right now it's, you know, I'm, I'm going at my own pace. Um, but it looks like cultivating, um, small circles and community around me. And so I have some sisters who through tragedy and triumph have, you know, gathered around me and we create space using, you know, and heal together using the work of peacemaking in circles. Um, but also I've just recently got back into um, some work that I'm doing in a contract with like the DOE and some training. Department of Education. Department of Education um, and some trainings with some other organizations. And so, you know, I'm, I'm able to move at my own pace um, and to say yes when my spirit says yes and no when it says no. Um, and slowly but surely make my way um, back. And and I don't know if I'm fully going to be fully integrated, but like at the same pace as I was moving before, um, but definitely showing up, you know, stronger than ever since everything, since chaos kind of hit. Yeah, for sure. Um, you were going at a pretty, um, you know, a pretty, a pretty rapid pace for those of you who aren't watching us uh we did some running movements uh with my body um you and i met probably four or five years ago um when you were in the middle of um you know working with a nonprofit and doing your um own consulting on the side and transitioning to that but i want to go back before you knew the word restorative justice i think one of the things that's common for people uh, who come on this podcast We've been doing restorative justice work before we knew what the words were. So uh, from your perspective, how did you start in this work? Um, before, so before I got here, I, I recognized that. So I was introduced to it in 2010, 2011. Time misses me sometimes. <laughs> um, but before that, I recognized like, so I used to run with, um, I always was surrounded by friends. Like I'm one of those people who, yeah, I just always was surrounded by friends. But I had this group of friends at the high school and it was really interesting because I was somebody who kind of got along with everybody. And my friends were like, we, <laughs> they've matured, we've all matured. But at that time, um, I ran with some girls that were like some fighters, some cousins. Like they, you know, we was all from the West Side and they, you know, they was doing what they needed to do to survive. Um, but it was interesting because like they would be, I played basketball and like they would be into it like, other people that I was low-key like friends with and I was always this person in like the middle trying to be like nah like let's not they didn't listen to me it didn't matter <laughs> <laughs> but I always found myself in the midst of um trying to like keep peace you know um I grew up in a household where like my mom and my dad were always in conflict um, and I think on the lowest of keys, like trying to protect them and myself and us that like, and not in the way where it was violent towards me, but it was just like always conflict in the house. Um, I was always trying to find ways to smooth things over, um, to make like, it didn't matter who was right or wrong, um, but to make people feel whole and to feel good um, however I can. And so I think that like, that was some of the ways that like, even as a young person, I was just showing up in the world that way. Um, and so when I was introduced to it um, as a training, someone um, sent me to a training for an organization I was working with and I was introduced to Cheryl Graves and Pamela Purdy. Um, and I sat in that four day training and I think I was in, I was the youngest person in the room. Um, and I think I was with like, it was all women. And if I'm not mistaken, these were like women who like were mothers and also like probation officers, um, who were coming together to, to learn how to, you know, <laughs> create peace in those communities. And it was so powerful. And I didn't know all of 
what I would do with the information and the practice that I was given at the time. Um, I knew I wanted to work with young people, but this lit a, a little flame under me. And I was like, wow, I can, I can do this. And um, there was a woman at the end of the training who came up to me and she was like, you can be doing this work. I can see you years from now. Like mm-hmm. you're going to be, you're going to be doing this work for your life. And I didn't know what to take, make of that at the time. Um, but lo and behold, and I couldn't see that at the time. Um, but it was definitely something, um, you know, I'm here now almost 10 years later standing in this work and I love it. And it has shifted even more, um, who I am today, um, and how I get to show up in the world, um, as a peacekeeper, as a warrior, as a conduit of healing, um, you know, as a curator of holding space for folks to heal, like it has really shifted me in a way that I, yeah, I just show up. So. Yeah. How, um, how impactful was it for someone in that moment, just when you learn this work to say like, Oh no, you got it. You got it. This is you. You know, um, I often say this and, For so a while now, something divine shows up in my life through the presence of Black women in particular um, that affirms me on my journey in ways that I wasn't looking for but it also becomes a guide. So this, she did that. I was 20. I had to be about 2000, 2011. Yeah, I was, I was 21. And um, when she said that to me, like I couldn't see it, but I was like, this woman sees something in me that I don't really understand. And shortly after that, because I got trained in like September or October and um, I was really struggling in school and I was like, I'm just ready to drop out. And soon after that, um, another woman um, came to me and she didn't really know me. She didn't really know what I was doing. She just would see me in passing at this organization I was volunteering for. And every day she would see me, she had asked me a different question. So she'd be like, do you sing? And I'd be like, no, she'd be like, okay. She was like, do you dance? And I was like, no, okay. And one day I did this um, workshop with these young people and um, she was there, but she had left and I was driving and I got this random call in the middle of the night. And I don't know how she had my, I figured, I figured out how she got my number, but I wasn't expecting her to call me. And she called me and she said, Ashley, like, you know, I've been wanting to tell you this, but I couldn't tell you until spirit told me it was okay to tell you. And I was like, huh? And she was like, God is going to use your voice to transform the lives of young people. Like, when you speak, they listen to you. And she said, so whatever you're going through right now, because I was going through it, I was going through a really rough and hard time. And she was like, whatever you're going through, she said, you got to push through it to get to the other side. Because there is something that is awaiting you. And like, God is using your voice for whatever that thing is. And so like, that's just an example of like how, like literally black women have continuously showed up in my life in moments of confusion or what felt like crisis for me. And, or, or when I didn't know where I was going or how I was going to get there and have like given me a word to say, like, keep going and move in that direction or push through or reminding me of who I am. Um, and so it was really impactful um, for her to be able to say that to me. And, and I always, when I tell that story, like I always look back and say, it was a, it was a woman that spoke these moments into my life before I could even see them. Um, and, and they continue to do that for me. And so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and 2011, um, 
what happened after that? Um, so I was, oh, so I was actually being trained to work with a woman who had a pilot program out of Chicago when they were just, I think they were really starting the the RJ hubs throughout the city. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she had this pilot program, um, that she wanted me to oversee and it was to go to like a couple of these different hubs and work with young people who were, um, on probation. I think it was like they were doing like alternative to incarceration program or something. Um, and I had to go in and do circles with them. And these were young people who had never been introduced to circles or restorative justice. Um, and I had to do it by myself. And so most times when we get trained, you know, they like, you know, do this work with a co-keeper. I ain't got no co-keeper. <laughs> and so I went out and not on, and so I was doing that while simultaneously um, doing work with um, some young people at the Chicago area project. Um, I, w- I was overseeing them. They, um, they had a youth advisory board. Um, that was responsible for helping other young people in the city get um, like funding for different projects and things like that. And so I was able to integrate, you know, and bring circles into that. And they were also getting trained. But I was in these communities with, you know, primarily young men who were on probation, um, introducing this, this idea of peacemaking in circles and restorative justice to them. Um, and building relationships with them. And, you know, it was a lot of trial and error because who's showing up to hold me accountable to like, don't, I don't, I'm learning what I'm doing. And so, um, but don't nobody else kind of see this because I'm in here with these young people by myself. Um, But I began to see the power of how we could build relationships through this process. I began to see like what it felt like to bring like values and agreements into spaces. And I was on the South side, which was really rare for me because I'm from the West side. And so I didn't do a lot of work on the South side. Mm -hmm. Um, But to be present with these young people who didn't know me, um, but through this process, we were able to really get to know each other and to build with one another, to see one another. And, that was all the proof I needed. You know, I was downtown working with these young people and just, and these are some of the young people who are still closest to me today, you know. Um, But then I got to do that work alongside people like um, Mashaun out of Chicago um, and a number of other people. And they were just showing me even doper and deeper ways to do this work. and so that that was it for me. I was like, I, I got to figure out how to how to do this and stand in this all the time. Um, shortly after I was moving to New York and I was like, whatever experience I got, I'm taking it with me and I'm going to New York with it. And I'm going to figure out how to do this thing there, wherever I'm at. Yeah. What did that look like in New York? Coming into a community of people who didn't know me. Um, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know because it was really interesting because when I came to New York, I didn't have, I legit, like I had zero family relatives here. I had zero real friends. I had one person that somebody from Chicago connected me to. um, And she turned out to be like a very like all out religious yeah, it was weird, but so that that's <laughs> slow. Um, but I um, when I got here, you know, I knew that it would be a struggle. But I'm also a person who like who creates community really like fairly not simple. But I don't have problem like if I live somebody with somebody. I was renting a room, and like the girl across from me probably became my first friend. Um, and then when I started in the program city year, I was surrounded by, you know, a lot of people in the same program as I was, but I instantly connected with, you know, one of my friends, um, it was Quandisha at the time. Um, 
and just building with people. You know, we in the same struggle together. And so, you know, we we bond and we build and we going out, we broke together, we eating together. Um, and so, you know, that was like my first sense of community um, and having to create that and be intentional about creating that because I knew I was in this big place by myself. Um, and they didn't, you know, a lot of people in New York didn't notice this idea of RJ and things like that. And so, you know, building community was just part of what I needed to survive. And so it was what I had to embody um, as well, you know. And so, so, you know, those people who my, were my initial friends ultimately became my family. Like, they became my family here in New York, my my wife, my sisters, my brothers, like they were the ones to this day um, who who get to, who show up for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's something about one about early twenties, but also about, you know, going through that, that similar struggle, but it does take intentionality about mm-hmm. building those relationships. Um, you know, you said you're someone who like does that pretty easily, but for people who, feel like, oh, I can't do this. I'm not outgoing like Ashley. Um, Maybe you can't directly speak to this because like that is who you are. But like, what are some of the ways that you did that? Well, um, I also, you know, put myself, I I had to, some of it, it it comes with a sense of trust and vulnerability, you know? So um, I, one of my, in the program, I had somebody who was like a supervisor But he was part of this program um, and he was like, I really want you to work with these young people that I'm working with outside of the program we were in. He was like, but you got to go through this training. And I was just like, okay, you know, like, all right, that's fine. And I didn't really know what it was, but what it did was it catapulted me into a whole, a bigger community um, of people who I didn't know. And not because I was like, oh, let me be everybody's friend, but because like we were put in a position to kind of build these relationships. Um, They were just people who I just held on to. And so I think, you know, for people who may not be as outgoing, I still think that there's a a sense of, of trust and vulnerability that you have to cultivate um, to even be open to the people because my mom used to always say this, like, you have to be be mindful of strangers because you could be entertaining angels, right? And so not to take for granted the people who are showing up in your life. Um, and, I, and I try my best to never take that for granted, right? To always see, like, why people are showing up in this space or in my life. Um, but I had to, again, I had to have a sense of trust about people showing up, right? Um, to know that, like, a, a more than there were more of them who were showing up for my good than those who were showing up for my bad. Um, And trusting that, you know, like I was, you know, ultimately and spiritually I was protected. I was going to be okay, you know? Um, But I had to trust, you know, why people were showing up. I had to learn to weed out their intentions and things like that. There were some who meant me no good. You know, there was some who wanted to humiliate me. You know, I was staying with some friends when I was homeless and they posted a picture of me on Instagram and was like, yeah, we're keeping Orphan Annie here with us. Like, and these are some white girls, you know, that I thought was cool. But, <laughs> you know, and again, those were the, those were some lessons, you know. It was some people who I trusted who took like real advantage of me. And I had and I took some L's, like some big L's I took, um, you know. But at the end of the day, they were also lessons, you know, and how to see people. Um, but more than anything, I had to, you know, trust that people wanted to see me do well. Um, and so they would put me in communication and contact with other people that they thought would um, help better my experience while being here. You know, and I, so I showed up to those places. Um, and so overall, I would say, you know, like have a, a sense of trust about your journey and why you are where you are and trust that like the universe and God and the divine and spirits are sending people your way to support you and to help you because we aren't created to take this journey alone. Yeah, I think 
there, there was so much in there. Um, what stands out the most, you know, this podcast is called This Restorative Justice Life. And what you just described is how the values that you learned in Circle, like this vulnerability and this trust, and I know you learned it in other places as well, but you take that into life and the individual relationships that you have with people. Um, and it's not clean, not neat. It's not a linear path to getting to where you want to go necessarily, but um, you have some of the strongest relationships in your life out of that, right? You build community when you model vulnerability um, and it doesn't always come back to you. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't does <laughs> always come. But for the times that it does, it's worth it. It's worth, you know, like my life is not promised without like to be lived without a sense of hurt. Um, you know, like things are going to happen that harm us and we learn from them. We heal, we can heal from them. Um, and so even people with good intentions, you know, can create harm. And so I can't close myself off from the possible experience of that person because there can be a gift that rests within our interaction, within our relationship. Um, and even if it's not like it's another relationship, you know, um, that we get to experience. I think part of it is part of this is just following your story. After City Year in New York, you were told to connect with like all these other people. Uh, where did those connections lead you? Oh, wow. Um, so I started this um, this transformation, like this leadership transformation program. And um, that's where I was really connecting with this larger group of people. Um, but so really interesting, me and Disha, um, so at this point, me and Disha are like, we rock and we best friends, but we're, we're experiencing a moment where both of us are kind of like houseless. <laughs> like we legit don't have our own place to like lay our head and different things like that. And we had just been kind of like duped by somebody who we trusted around housing. And there was a woman who um, was part of this program that I, this, this other community that I was introduced to. And um, she told me to come meet her at her job because she was going to do something to support us in getting housing. And um and I didn't know what this place was. I didn't know where I was going. And um, when I get there, I'm sitting in the lobby waiting for her, right? So when I tell you, like, again, how Black women show up, right? I'm sitting in the lobby waiting for her. And again, I, it's this really nice building, you know, in West Harlem. And I don't know where I'm at. I saw Columbia, but I don't know where I'm at. But she, this is address. So as I'm sitting there, Three women who I had met over my time in New York, and this is less than a year, three women come through at different times, come through the lobby at different times. And I met them all for separate occasions. And they like, oh, hey, Ashley, like, I always knew you'd be a good fit for this school. And I was like, what? Because again, I don't know the context or where I'm at. And so um, I'm like, okay, you know, it's good to see you too. And so then another person comes and they're like, hey, Ashley, like, oh man, I always knew seminary would be good for you. Like, you know, and they're checking in. And I was like, again, like, I don't have an idea what seminary is. I don't know, have an idea about where I'm at, like location wise. Um, and then another person comes through and does the same thing. And these are all three women. And so then the lady who I'm there and I'm supposed to meet, we're talking and stuff. And she's like, you know, there's somebody who I want you to meet. And I was like, okay, you know, at this point we're in the school and she's, you know, we're just talking and checking in. And on our way up, there's a friend, my friend Keisha, that she became my friend through this other program. And she was like, Ashley, what are you doing here? She's the friend of a friend. She like, what are you doing here? And I was like, you know, I came here to meet Lorena. And she was like, oh. And she looked at me and she said, she should meet Dean Jenkins. And I was like, what's happening here? You know, um, but like longer story short, I go meet this woman and 
She's like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I'm supposed to go to NYU next year to get my master's in social work. She was like, well, Columbia has a, a master's in social work. You can get a dual degree here with a master's in divinity. I don't even know what a master's in divinity is. Like, I didn't come here to sign up for school. <laughs> I came here to get something that I needed to make sure that I can have housing. Um, but, like, that's an example. And so, ultimately, like, two weeks later, you know, I'm enrolled in this Union Theological Seminary, you know? Um, and so that's an example of how, like, a, like being introduced and being open and vulnerable to where spirit is leading you to the people that spirit is bringing into your life because going into union created an entire another community for me that was most transformative during that time because that was 2014 that was the year of Michael Brown Eric Garner like all these things were happening in the world and I was catapulted you know into a lot of activism and a lot of harm in the world, a lot of chaos, but a lot of love, revolutionary love. You know, it was a union where I met people and community, my brothers and sisters, you know, that I call now, um, who helped me find my voice. I was introduced to educators like Dr. James Cone, um, who affirmed my writing and my voice when I felt like it was probably one of the weakest things that I embodied. Um, but it was there where I learned how to fight, you know. Um, it was there where I truly began to learn about justice and action um, and love and liberation and, and revolution. Um, and so all these places led to somewhere else, you know. And so that's what I mean when I say like, you know, that community introduced me to something else and someone else introduced me to a, a whole nother community. And I am where I am because those same, those interactions continue to happen. So uh, for those of you who are watching, you can see the sh both the shirts Ashley and I are wearing. But for those of you that can't, um, they both say the word breathe and it defines breathe as the balance, restore, empower, affirm, transform, heal and embody. Yeah. Breathe is uh, the organization that Ashley founded. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how that started. Um, so kind of in that same time frame I was telling you about between being houseless and being introduced to this school, I had also, um, I had quit, um, city year because I was also, I was trying to do circles there and the principal, she didn't like it because I was really building relationship with kids. They were trying to throw away. Um, and so she would give me a really hard time about different things. And there was just some things that I refused to do because I felt like it wasn't beneficial to the kids. And so I was like, it's either going to be me or I'm a, I'm a tear up city year. Like <laughs> just going to be a rebel and I'm just going to give them the hardest time. And so I chose to leave. Um, and when I left, I was offered actually a job to, um, I had made a declaration. I was like, I want to do restorative justice work in circles with young people in the juvenile justice system. Um, and literally maybe a couple of days later, I get an email and they were looking for somebody to, um, they wanted me to come in to have an interview with this organization called Youth Advocates Program um, because they had a partnership with the Department of Probation and Juvenile Justice. And they wanted to create, they wanted to use this idea they had of circles to create space and a program for girls who were commercially sexually exploited. Um, and now it was, it's really interesting because when I was in Chicago, I used to do work in a juvenile justice um, detention center. And one of the things I used to quietly say to myself is like, I'm not planning no work, with no girls. Like I seen girls flip over tables with officers like holding them. And I was like, it's just going to be too much. And that was my, like my real thing. I was like, I bond better with young men and it just, and so to do this work with young women, I was like, well, okay. All right. I, and this is what I asked for. 
Um, and so I began to create this framework for using peacemaking circles um, for these girls that I thought they had identified. But the problem was they systemically and why, like with their current protocol, they couldn't identify these girls. And so they just had funding <laughs> for this thing, this idea, but had no way of kind of seeing it through. And so um, at the time, our program, and one of the things I had studied and knew about was that like a lot of programs, the funding was geared around young men um, that were probably less than 1% or 0.1% at the time. Programs specifically in the juvenile justice system created for young women, um, especially here in New York City. And so we had two girls in our program who were like mandated by probation to attend um, the overall program, but not this specific one. And so I was like, you know, well, we have two girls. They don't have to be identified as anything. Like, let's just do the program with them so that they can have a space because they didn't have programs that they can go to. And so I started with those two. And um, those two would bring their friends. So they would bring girls who weren't mandated, who weren't on probation. These were girls from the community from the Bronx. And so we went from having like two or three girls who were mandated to now having 13, 14, 15 girls in a room. And one of the things, and, and Disha was still working with City Year, but she would come out on Monday evenings to do the circles with me. Um, and we, we realized like, this is what they want. Like they need this space. Girls need this space to show up authentically. They need this space to speak their truth. They need this space to fight it out if they need to, because it was friends in a room that were beefing with one another. Um, they need this space to heal relationships with themselves and with their mothers and with other people. They need this space, like they need this space to breathe. And at first it was just circles for my sisters um, that we would do. And that evolved into this idea of one day I was sitting down and I was writing and it was kept coming up for me. Um, and it was like, breathe. And I ran it by Disha and she was like, that's what we're about to start calling it. And so um, it became brief circles for my sisters, but it really started out of us identifying a need that Girls were, without saying, they were showing up and saying, I need this. I want to be a part of this. I, I need to be, I want to be in community uh, where people can really see me, where I can be vulnerable and I don't have to be tough or I can share the hard things that's happening with me and know that I'm not alone. Um, or I can share the good things that's happening with me and I can be celebrated, you know, um, I can heal and I can discover what healing means for me. Cause some of my girls was, didn't even like this idea of healing was not a thing. It wasn't language that they knew. And I, and I understood that because the language, right? Like literally the word heal um, was when I'm thinking holistically, like mind, body, spirit, um, trauma, like that wasn't language that I knew until I was an adult. And I will always imagine like, what if I had this practice and these tools when I was a teenager? How could my life have shifted if I knew how to engage in conflict different, right? If I knew that I had the power and the tools within me to heal myself um, and to be a part of community and to help hold somebody else um, in ways that were healthy because we did them, right? As young people, we like we did that. When me and my friends, we was going through a bunch of stuff and we would look up and it wasn't until I was old, I was writing about this. And I'm like, where was our parents? Like, where were they? Like, we was out here like, we was getting drunk, we was doing, and it wasn't because they was bad parents, but we were dealing the best way we knew how. And I look back and I realized like, oh, our mothers were also dealing the best way that they knew how that sometimes they couldn't see us because they were, had their own thing they was trying to get through, right? Um, 
And so it wasn't neglect. They was just trying to make it too. Um, and so like, how, how, how can we help support heal that? And so we started, we would invite parents and mothers <laughs> into the circle. Um, you know, but it, it started out as that. That is how we started. It started with three girls who brought some friends um, and they helped us realize that we were them, um, that we needed this as much as they did. Um, and also that because it wasn't mandated for majority of them to show up, we knew that they wanted it. You know, they 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 didn't have to report to nobody to show. They was just like, I'm coming on Monday. I'm going to be there. Can I come this? Can I bring my sister? We was like, yeah. You know, we didn't have a layout of how to do this. We was just like, the circle is here. You can show up. You're invited. You're welcome. Yeah. Can you talk about the importance of that voluntary nature of the work? Yeah. Um, so, like, even with girls who were mandated, we always told them that they had a choice. To be here. And when we would go into courtrooms and things like that, you know, if they would try to send a young person to our, you know, into our circle, we would have to let the judge know <laughs> that like, like they're invited. And when they come, they might stay because we think they'll have, you know, they'll get what they need. But we will never force them to stay. Because I think that it's important that they had the opportunity to choose that, right? Um, to buy into it, to know that it was a safe space. They had to decide that for themselves. Um, and I think when they were able to do that, they were even more open. They were more vulnerable because it was their choice, right? They had, they could take all the time that they needed. They didn't have, if they needed to miss some days, we wasn't pressing them. It was just like, this is a space where we are creating this for you. And this is what, you know, we dream of and, you know, for you. And this is how we, we want to create a space where you feel loved, valued, and seen, um, and where you can be a full and authentic self. And if you want to come, come. And I think that the invitation, instead of the mandate, um, opened up their eyes to be like, in their hearts to be like, I think I'm gonna go to that and see what it's about. And when they got there, they was like, oh yeah, like this, I, I'll keep coming to this, you know? And so I think that like, it was really important for them to know that they had a choice in common um, and that they wouldn't be penalized if they didn't come, you know? Um, and so I think it took away the the threat of anything. And it was just, it was just community that was there. Right. I think a lot of the times when folks think about restorative justice, it's just like the alternative to a punitive system. But if you're forcing someone into a restorative yeah. uh, alternative, um, then it it doesn't work. You like you that's that's that that's the opposite of what we're trying to do. Like I'm not going. I can't penalize. Like this this point is not to penalize you or exclude you. But it is to welcome you from jump like into a like an environment that we're creating for you to feel safe in, you know. And I can't determine what makes you feel safe. Only you can do that. So by standing in your choice, you're choosing to say that, like, I feel I'm feeling or I'm sensing this. And so I can enter it. You know, I, I want to trust it. So I'm going to step into it versus somebody saying, like, you have to go to that. And you showing up, you like, what is this? And I don't, and maybe I'll say I am, right? Like, I'm resistant. I am somebody who is, Disha could tell me to, like, go wash the dishes. And if I was, if I was planning to wash them already, I'm just like, I don't want to do it now <laughs> because you, <laughs> you ain't have to tell me to go wash them. You could have just asked mm -hmm. me and been like, Hey, can you go watch this? It's the invitation. It's the way that you do things that makes people want to show up and do them differently, right? Like, but don't tell me what I have to do. And so, <laughs> because I'm resisting at this point. Um, and I would say, and don't ask me in a way that's actually telling me. Yeah, like Violin telling me, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> 
I get I get voluntold by elders and I respect them in a different way. So I'm just like, oh, but okay, all right. <laughs> you knew I was gonna do it. Um, but I think that like I think that there is there's power in people being able to choose, you know, um, and how they want to engage in things, you know, and and what they want to confront. Um, and we don't we don't rush that time and we don't rush that process, you know. And so I think that, you know, invitation has always been our way. And that's because it is also the restorative way. And that's what our work is, is rooted in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's something about bringing people like I, I guess like this whole idea of agency. Um, it's so important like and it's really about like dignifying someone as a human Mm -hmm. acknowledging that like you're not just this problem that needs to get solved you're not just a you know a thing that like we need to like either fill a quota for in our program (laughs) or like something that like we need to like achieve right like you're a person uh you are we want to be in a relationship with you um we want to walk alongside you um, and that's been what you've been doing with Breathe from the jump. But that's not all that Breathe has been doing. Um, tell me more about what Breathe has been up to. So um, our work has expanded in a way um, that has been really beautiful. So um, I started doing work in the schools. I was working for a nonprofit organization doing um, as a restorative justice coordinator and then a program director overseeing some restorative justice implementation. Um, but after that, I started doing like consulting on the side with a number of organizations about how to bring RJ into schools and to their organizations. And so we, like I was beginning to expand from just a practitioner and keeper and by also by way of a blessing that I was seeking. You know, like one of the things that I said was that, you know, I didn't want to step into a position or a role as a trainer or anything like that, unless I kind of received a blessing from some of my elders. And in 2017, we were in Oakland and mm-hmm. Cheryl gave me that blessing. You know, she gave me the blessing to kind of just move forward in the work that I was doing and trust in the work that I was doing. Um, and I needed that because it was my permission. You know, I understood that this practice wasn't mine. I understood that, um, you know, I just had a reverence for my elders who were doing the work and the work that was happening before I even showed up to it. And so I wasn't trying to position myself as an expert of anything, you know. Um, but Cheryl gave me that blessing. And so I began to, we began to do training. Um, so we were training and consulting and coaching. Um, and so it expanded in that way. And also, so Disha, um, Kondisha, my partner in Bree, my co-founder in Bree, but also my partner in life and wife, um, you know, like she has, she's magical with her hands when it comes to nourishing people. You know, and so while we were doing Breathe Circles for My Sisters, uh, we had left the organization that we were doing it with. And so even though they only gave us like $25 a week for like food or in, in transportation for our girls. So we were still doing a lot out of pocket. We were really doing this work out of pocket, um, like no funding for real. And so... We looked around and we was eating the same things in our community. Um, and we we're working mostly out of the South Bronx. And it comes with its barriers when it comes to food. And so the issue was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm <gonna> start cooking. <laughs> um, and so she started, you know, just really cooking for breathe like the circles of my sister's program but when we were a program the young men would be in the other program either way and so they was just always eating with us regardless and so it started off with her just cooking for our young people um and when she began to fully step into that gift of hers that created this lane for breathe cafe and so it was about how do we utilize 
our foundational principles about building community. Now we're doing it through food. And so we were feeding the young people in our program, but then we started to partner with other programs that were working with young people and we were like catering for them. Um, and we would, you know, serve them like, cause we are also, we are, we're servants in this process. And so like using food as a, as a, as a, as a pathway to healing, um, while embodying these restorative practices, right? So we come to the table, we'll go and we'll hold circle spaces with different programs while we're feeding them as well. Um, And it expanded to full like catering and nourishment. Um, And so now she's, you know, going through this process of becoming a health, um, holistic nutrition, because we're talking about how do we care for ourselves holistically? And so she brings that into breathe. Um, and last but not least, we have this space. Um, and in full transparency, you know, like, I don't know how long it'll be sustained here, but um, we have the House of Breathe, um, which is our community space. And it is a space designed to be able to host and hold community members and create spaces of healing in the South Bronx because there were none. Um, we didn't have, we, we barely had space to hold circles and programs without folks trying to charge us too much or like we can be consistent because their hours were fluctuating and stuff. And so we found a space where we could live, but also, you know, um, we got the, the landlord to knock in two walls out in the garden level um, to create this open concept space where we could do trainings where we can gather folks, where we can have um, different events where we can gather together and breathe together and and be and have joy and experience revolutionary love. And so this space is called the House of Breathe. Um, And yeah, so yeah, those are all the different ways, you know, Breathe has has grown. We've done work in Africa with our sister friend, Khadija, who is a yogi. Like we we've, we've been everywhere doing this work. And so it's really been a blessing, you know, since we started. Both for the people that you work with and for yeah. you as uh well I think about like you and Disha together, but um you specifically. Um, you know, it's not a linear path. It's right. not just a, a straight, like, mm-hmm. you know, I started at City Year, I got to seminary, I yeah dropped out of city year like all all these things um what are some of the things or maybe one um time where like in that like i don't feel like doing this anymore um what kept you going two times and i'll be quick so it was one time when i was leaving the I was leaving the program. I was getting ready to leave the program, Youth Advocates program where I was working, where I started doing the circles. And um, I was also a youth advocate specialist. And so I had my own kind of case, like young people on my caseload where I was, I had to be an advocate and mentor for um, mostly girls. And um, I, had a really interesting situation with one of my young people and um I didn't know what to do like I was trying to protect her but also like be in relationship with her for some things and we had this big falling out on top of like I was in school I was a full-time student I'm working all these hours the world is on fire um this was 2015 all these nine indictments were coming down and I was exhausted. And I felt like, excuse my language, I felt like I had really fucked up in this relationship with this young person. And I was just like, I don't want to do this no more. Um, And I was on my way out and one of the other girls who were part of our program, she wasn't on, she was never on probation or anything. She called a case. And when they, she went to court, she told them about 
the circles for my sisters. Mm -hmm. And so the judge mandated her to the program. To, and she requested me to be her advocate. <laughs> and so while I was getting ready to quit, I was, I was done. Um, she showed up and it was like, we still need you. Um, Cause she, she sought that out. She went through this whole process. Like she got her, and it was like, she got arrested and knew that she was gonna tell him that <laughs> she needed to come to this program. Um, and so when I thought I was on my way out, you know, she showed up and pulled me back in, um, and not in a way where I was resistant, but in a way that she was reminding me about why I was doing this in the first place. Um, and yeah, so that was the first time, but the second time, and the reason why I wanted to say this is because, um, this time with COVID really was a space where I was ready to quit, you know, in full transparency. And I had said this to some, somebody messaged me on Instagram and was like, sis, like, you know, we need you out here. We, you know, we really want to see you out here doing the work. And I was like, you got it. Like, I'm proud to see you have it. You know, I'm proud to look up and see that, you know, it's, it's your quotes and your words that are floating around. Um, so if I had to leave to the scene today, I, I know that there are people who have walked alongside of me, who I have um, introduced to this work and have become phenomenal in it. Um, and I was just like, you know, I'm not needed. You know, um, yeah, I don't need me here. You know, I don't need to be in this work right now. Like, and it also felt very saturated and, I, and I and and in all transparency, like I miss being with the people. Like my 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 spirit missed hugging folks. It missed seeing and feeling the energy of people. And you can't really get that when you're online. Um, you know, where you can read somebody's body and know that like they they're not okay, or um, that like they need they got something that they want to say or that they may need to take a break. We may have to tap in a bit more. Um, and I desired that and I missed it. And I was like, this doesn't feel, this doesn't, the way that I have to transition, not sure I have to, but the way that I'm having to adapt doesn't feel good. And I wanted to quit. I was just like, maybe, you know, I'll catch people on the back end you know, of, of this pandemic. <laughs> and, and so I was, I was really wanting to, to walk away from it. But again, um, it was a reminder from Black women around me. It was a reminder from young people around me um, and a request to show up, a loving request to show back up. Um, and and in in however way I needed to, and so it didn't right. come with a like come back and do it this way. But like mm. we see you, um, we want you here. We want you here, and however that looks like for you, right? Just show back up. And yeah, because I was gonna say there's a difference between like just responding to everything that everybody asks you to do. Yeah. And um, what you just described, it's like, you know, um, you're needed in this space, but being needed to show up in the way that you can right now. And so for me, that was, that, that is, that felt good. You know, it didn't feel like pressure. It didn't feel like, um, like this mandate for responsibility or any, it just felt like we see you, we love you, we need you and we want you here, you know? And so I was like, okay, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. So what comes next? Um, you know, day by day, actually, you know, it's still some days where I'm like, I told you the other day, I was I was preparing something and I was like, I don't know if this is gonna even work. And I was like, you said I can just not work. <laughs> she, just, 
She was like, take your time. And I was, <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, um, what comes next is we taking it day by day. But right now, um, I'm I'm dreaming of, you know, reimagining what Breathe Circles for my sisters was. Um, and we're creating a program of something called the Peacekeepers um, that I'm really excited about and how, because I think that it, it is the embodiment of how we've changed and because how we've changed individually and personally, of course, breathe shifts. And I think this is what we're creating is, um, it is the personification of that shift. Um, season where we get to acknowledge who we are today not who we were in 2014, 2015, and 2016, but who we are today and to create from that space. And so what's next is um, reimagining and framing up um, what this new thing is, but also um, moving forward in doing this work. And when I say this work, um, whether that's training or consulting in community, um, in the ways that feel good for our spirit. Um, because this is spirit work and in the ways that spirit leads us to do it. And so that's what's next. So you'll see me and I'll be doing some trainings. I plan to collaborate with you. Um, you've been hold, you've been holding me in my ebbs and flows and I'm grateful for that. Um, and I'm looking forward to you know, the possibilities of um, doing work alongside or with you. Um, Yeah, I'm going to be doing some coaching really soon, like some individual coaching. Um, Yeah, so. Yeah. Where can people learn more about what you've got going on and support uh, if they feel so moved? You can go to our IG page. It is The Breathe underscore so b-r-e-a-t-h-e underscore collective on ig and on that it is in our bio it's the links to our other pages um and then on you can go to our web page at the breathe collective.org and those will all be linked in the description for folks um you can also are, are these shirts still available Yes, yeah, so we're getting um, some new batches made now in the fall since we've settled back in. And so we'll have shirts and we'll have hoodies and we have a couple more things we're putting out there. They are very soft. Thank you. I must say. <laughs> um, I just have a couple like quick, uh, I, I thought they were quick questions. People have been taking longer to answer them. Uh, but uh, just a couple quick questions before uh, we go. Uh, restorative justice is... Restorative justice is a process to be fully human, acknowledging harm, hurt, and the pathways to healing. It is also, in its essence, um, community personified and relationships. What is one place you wish people knew this work? One place I wish people knew this work. At home, my family. Follow-up question. How has it been trying to do this work with your family? Extremely hard. Um... I think really quick, I think that my ways of being and embodying the practices of this work has shifted, I think, more more profoundly than anybody. Um, Like my mom, like in her ability to either listen and understand, but it's still really hard for her. Um, But 
you know, some, I think there's a, my pastor once said to me, like, you know, a prophet is often not heard in his own town or court or something like that. It's scripture. Um, even though I went to seminary, I'm not great with it. <laughs> um, but I feel like sometimes that's how it feels when I'm trying to, to do, when I'm trying to be this work, with my family, um, and it's really because, you know, that we all have compounded trauma. You know, I've had the opportunity and the language to deal with, unpack, and, and heal through some of that versus the opportunities that they've had. So all I can do is, is embody it and be it and engage with it in ways that I know how. Yeah. You get to sit in circle with four people. Who are they and what do you talk about? Oh, uh, four people who I get to sit in circle with. Um, I would talk, I would, Audrey Lord. Mm, hold on, wait, I'm sorry, Audrey. Let me take that back. I'm going to go with my grandma, Bessie, who I never had the chance to meet. My grandmother, my grandma Madea, who I always desire to have a closer relationship with, personal relationship. Um, Lauren Hill and my future daughter. Um, and we will talk about, it'll be an intergenerational conversation about the ways in which we get to dream of freedom and liberation and love radically the best way that we know how. Um, what's one thing that you want everyone listening to this podcast to know? Um, that even as a practitioner, I am, I'm fully human. Um, and that every day is a practice to show up in the fullness of my humanity, um, undoing and unpacking oppression, <laughs> um, hurt, and harm. And so as I hold space for the work for others to show up, that um, I am also engaging in this work and other practitioners, and to see other practitioners in their humanity as well um, while doing that. I'm guilty of this myself, not with you, but with other people, seeing people who I admire and putting them up on pedestals, thinking that they've got it all together um, and they don't need help. They don't need support. They don't need rest. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important that uh, people uh, who look at people in your position like full humans, because yeah. we all are. Yeah. Um, Wait, can I just, because you said that this last thing is... And I think that this is my message to like practitioners and activists and, and revolutionary fighters and people on the front lines is um, take the time to rest. Um, there was a pastor um, Emma Simpson and she said to us one time and um, there's a song that says, I need you to survive. It says, I need you, I need you. Um, and at the end, they said, I need you to survive. And she looked at us and said, yes, and like, I need you to survive. So not this condition that I need you um, so that I can survive, but that there's this request that I need you, Right. I need you to survive. I need you to live and to not be a martyr for this work. 
because that is that is that's capitalism, right? To exhaust you so that you can because if you're a martyr, then you're one less person than we have to fight. Um, and so like take the time. So we we talk about it all the time, self-care, and we post it in memes and, and we do different things, but really rest and know that like you are not the only one fighting and that it does not rest in your hands um, and that the fight is not over because we won one, one battle right now, right? And so we have to be prepared to continue to fight and to do that, we have to rest. So, um, for the longevity, we have to, to rest. We have to make room for other people to show up because when you say no to something, you give the opportunity for somebody else to say yes. And it truly is an opportunity. Um, and so, you know, it's okay to say no. It's okay to step back. It's okay to yes, because like we need you. We need you to survive. We don't need more martyrs for the revolution. Yeah. Um, and finally, who's one person I should have on this podcast? One person that you should have on this podcast. Um, I'm going to go with Michelle. Um, yeah, because at the end of the day, bro, really, he introduced me to the, how to operate in this work fully in your gift in the way that God has created you to do the work. He showed me radical and dope in different ways to do it um, or to even imagine it. And so I would say, you know, Sean. Well, I'll hit him up. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Ashley, uh, for spending time with me this morning uh, and for all of the people who are listening, for sharing your, your story, your wisdom. Uh, with all of us. Any parting words? Um, thank you for living and leaning into Amplify RJ. Um, thank you for saying yes to the call when it showed up for you. Um, and thank you for creating space for people to learn this work in real ways. And so I love you. <laughs> Um, I love you. I love you. And I'm grateful for you. Mm -hmm. Received. Uh, I love you too. And I meant parting words for the people, not for me. <laughs> it is what the people meant. Uh, <laughs> you know, just, you know, I think that the parting words that I will have for the people is to remember to breathe. Um, Literally, you know, to to practice balance, restoration, empowerment, affir affirmation, transformation, healing, and embodiment. But also, like, inhale and exhale. Remember your breath. Remember the essence of why you get to walk around every day. It is in your breath. And so remember to breathe because the world is trying to take it, you know. Um, Zora Neale Hurston said, they'll... Um, if you're silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it, you know. Um, and like we, we weren't created to die right now, you know, not to be killed in that way. And so don't let them take your breath. Don't let them take it in, in, in silence. Breathe. Breathe out loud. Breathe as much as you need to breathe. Breathe to live um, because we need you. We need each and every last one of you. So just remember to keep breathing through it. Thank you all for listening. Be well, and we'll talk to you soon. Like what you heard? Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast on whatever platform you're using right now. It really helps us further amplify this work. Follow us on our social platforms at AmplifyRJ, and check out all of AmplifyRJ's events and workshops at amplifyrj.eventbrite.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.